Good morning and welcome. Thanks for joining us today. It is a great morning. I am here with Doug Gray and he's going to tell us about how to lead in 2021. Nine tips. Doug, off to you. Nine tips. Let's get going. So um, the world has changed in, in the Q1 and Q2 of 2020. Moving on. To that point, you and I have talked about E, E, and O, the three measures of whatever uh, team drivers. And I think there's confusion. I think in, in history, we've focused on effectiveness, getting the work done, or efficiency. But we haven't always been intentional about outcomes or performance outcomes or behavior outcomes. I think we'll, we'll become more intentional ahead because it provides a competitive advantage. So Most Doug, I'm curious, in this, this fabulous book, did you have effectiveness, efficiency, and outcomes? Of course I did, but I focused on outcomes. <laughs> and the reason is that most businesses are fairly effective and are fairly efficient. So to have a competitive advantage, there has to be some unique performance outcome or behavioral outcome that's different. I'm glad you've got the book. In the similar way, number five out of nine, uh, the singularity is here to stay. This is not a science fiction notion of technology and adoption. To be clear, this is a form of technology. A book, a pencil is a form of technology. It doesn't need to be necessarily cool digital access to a artificial intelligence that aut uh, automatically replies when you say, hello Siri, can I be your executive coach right now? And Siri says, no Doug, not at this time. <laughs> but we're moving in that direction. So let's assume that we're going to be intentional about selecting technology and we're always going to use video for the rest of our lives because we know that we're social animals. We know that we need visual trust and it's augmented by being able to see one another's smiling face. Good morning, John. To me, it leads to these, these questions. How do you measure your wealth? Or how do you measure your capital? Or even are you wealthy? And I'm pausing because most folks answer it with that first bucket. They say, yep, I'm financially wealthy. Here's my net worth, here are my assets and liabilities. And I know what I've got. And I know that when I die, it's gonna pass on to my loved ones or it's gonna pay for my healthcare. And then I'll be empty handed. <laughs> the average American currently has less than $250,000 in net worth. Tragic number, most folks don't save enough. Human capital is a second way to measure wealth. What do you know? And it's not a rhetorical. So John, what do you know? It's what are your knowledge, skills, and abilities, your KSAs, that uh, fill the bookshelf behind you? This is all your expertise in, in the 40 plus years of your uh, career development, your serving clients and all that. You know so much. And you also know so many people. Social capital is what we were just talking about, that, ne that network analysis, the map. These are the 75 people you could invite to dinner on Saturday night, on average. It's up to 75. I don't know that I've got 75. <laughs> Especially if you have room in the house for 75. We've got a good house for it. You're right. But these three measures are uh, resource-based views of capital. They uh, will, they're, they're finite, they're limited. And in the last five years of my life, I'm going to forget everything I know. I'm going to forget your name. Sorry, buddy. And, and, and that's just the reality. In contrast, Psychological capital is a construct that psychologists know about, and it's, it's infinite, and it's who we are becoming. And I don't want to sound loosey-goosey because it's defined by these, these four um, dimensions, variables on the far left, hope, efficacy, resiliency, and optimism. I think these are going to become critically important measures of effective teams in 2021. And I, I can share a specific example of this, but uh, let me define each of them first. Uh, hope by itself is a good thing. We need the will and the way to find a, uh, a cure for this particular COVID virus. But it's not an abstraction. Uh, the will and the way is, is tied sometimes to efficacy, our ability to do the research to find that. And our resilience, our, our ability to respond to this pandemic to the previous level or beyond. American military is being taught resilience and their loved ones are being taught resilience uh, at no cost by a bunch of positive psychologists. Optimism is a choice. It's our generalized positive affect. It's when you choose to be optimistic about the future, even in a career transition. And the fact is that all four of these have what's called a second order effect. Hope and efficacy are stronger than hope by itself or efficacy by itself. 
How strong? This strong. This is one of those places where nerds know something that practitioners need to apply. So if workplace engagement or employee engagement scores are defined by these four measures, maybe managers could talk about hope, efficacy, resilience, and optimism more often, teach it, train it, develop it. These are all developmental skills. And maybe it would describe job satisfaction scores in a significant way. And maybe it would lead to more organizational commitment, regardless of whether you're working from home or working in a, in a physically centralized location. And I modeling know. that in the workplace, that, that becomes essential. Think about those great workplaces where you've had excellent leaders and managers who have helped you build hope, efficacy, resilience, and optimism. They didn't say these things, go build some hope, go build some hope. No, right. they modeled it and it helped you thrive as opposed to the managers who micromanaged or the leaders who said, no, don't do this. That's not what we need to do. And the differences probably made a huge difference in your workplace engagement, your job satisfaction, and your commitment to that organization. Yes, and uh, let's transfer it to another example, you and your family. I think our, uh, our role models in families and churches, perhaps, and some schools that have the autonomy to, to model hope, efficacy, resilience, and optimism is higher. SICAP is certainly higher, and the uh, results are higher than in some work environments. The fact is that any of us can apply these models to uh, our, our personal lives, our professional lives, our families, our loved ones. And we're, I, I think we're seeing some examples of this. Um, you and I live in, in Nashville where musicians are on um, Skype, uh, on Zoom and making recordings and sharing on Instagram. And what are they talking about? These four dimensions. How do we respond? How do we keep the music industry alive? How do we keep the arts alive? How do we share our empathy? with disenfranchised populations, the Black Lives violence we've seen in the last two weeks. So the point is that if we use these words as vocabulary, we can implement them in our workforce. In fact, you and I have talked in the past about the nine box that some HR leaders use. I think it's silly, it's destructive, and it's goofy because I don't know somebody's potential. In fact, it's a goofy model if somebody uh, intentionally doesn't show up to work as often because they're caring for a loved one at home or a woman's going, uh, is, is pregnant. Of course, her potential is differently measured during that period of pregnancy, but that's not reflected in many of these rubrics. So what if we use two uh, objective measures? For instance, PSYCAP can be measured can, and can change over time. And what if we measured performance, low, medium, and high? And then we articulated who are the potential and more likely performers and who's a talent risk? And what if everybody's in the upper boxes or the right boxes? And what if we identify those who are talent risks and we get rid of intentionally people who have, are low on hope and don't have any optimism, they're pessimists, they choose pessimism, it's a learned behavior. They don't practice resilience in the marketplace or at work and they don't demonstrate their capacity to do their job. What if we identify those people objectively, track them over time, call them talent risks and move them on, out of our organizations, out of our teams? Or the flip side is once you identify them as talent risks, because these are flexible and fungible, you can build hope, you can build optimism, efficiency, resilience. So if you're committed to that person, don't just set them aside and let them be dead wood for the organization, build them up. Right, and that's often what we do, right? We tend to coach the low performers. Uh, my opening point about agility and collaboration, I think is, is relevant here. Um, my uh, invitation is not to waste too much time or money on